I'm Avi Loeb, and you're listening to Alien Theories Theorizing. Welcome to Alien Theorist Theorizing. We got a special episode today. We have Avi Loeb on. Uh, I'm Brayden. I'm Zell. I'm Dan. Yeah, we're very excited. This, of course, is Avi Loeb. That is Avi Loeb over there on the other end. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. And if, for those of you who don't know, Avi Loeb is the founding director of Harvard University's Black Hole Initiative, director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. The former chair of the astronomy department at Harvard University, he chairs the advisory board for the Breakthrough Starshot Project and is a former member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and a former chair of the Board on Physics and Astronomy of the National Academies. Safe to say, the smartest man we've interviewed on the show yeah. thus far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bar down, 100%. Um, he's going to be speaking at Contact in the Desert at the end of June here. So, um, Avi, just the first question I want to ask you is, what was the catalyst that got, got you started into like astrophysics, astronomy, just space in general? Was there like a central event as a child or what got you going? Well, it was just circumstances. I grew up on a farm. I used to collect eggs every afternoon and uh, I was mostly interested uh, as a kid in in philosophy in, in uh, the most fundamental questions and I used to read philosophy books uh, while driving a tractor to the hills of the village every weekend and uh, but then uh, I was born in Israel and I had to serve in the military that's obligatory at age 18 and uh, I had two options either to pursue physics and uh, get recruited to a program that allowed me to get a PhD uh, in physics or to run in the fields with a gun and I preferred the first because uh, it's closer to philosophy. And then uh, uh, I um, proposed a project that was funded, the first international project to be funded by the Star Wars initiative of President Reagan back in the mid 1980s. And uh, uh, that became a, a whole uh, uh, department. Uh, uh, and I was one of the leaders of that uh, project and uh, visited the Washington DC. In one of the visits, uh, I, I went to Princeton, New Jersey and um, visited the Institute for Advanced Study where Albert Einstein used to be a faculty uh, decades earlier. And uh, they offered me a five-year fellowship under the condition that I'll switch to astrophysics. And I, I couldn't turn this down. It's just like, uh, this offer, you know, in the Godfather that uh, you cannot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he made you an offer you couldn't refuse. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then uh, after that, there was another one uh, that came from Harvard University that I couldn't refuse uh, for a faculty position. And at the end, uh, you know, it was just like an arranged marriage. Uh, but I, I felt that I'm actually married to my true love because in astronomy, we can address philosophical questions uh, using the scientific method. So uh, I'm uh, quite happy that I uh, ended up uh, along this path, but it was not my choice, you see. I, but um, it, it ended up uh, uh, bringing me to exploration of space. And, you know, in 2016, we announced uh, the first project to visit the nearest stars. It's called the Starshot. Right. And um, uh, that you know, that's the most ambitious uh, space project there is. So Starshot, Starshot is a project to send like a, like a probe to another system or what exactly would you be sending? Right. So um, uh, in uh, uh, May 2015, uh, an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley uh, came out of a black limousine in front of the Center for Astrophysics uh, at Harvard and uh, entered my office and sat uh, on the sofa in front of me and asked me, his name is uh, Yuri Milner. He asked me whether I'm willing to mm. lead uh, a project to visit the nearest star within his lifetime. And that meant uh, getting there within, let's say 20 years or so. Uh, and I knew that the nearest star is about four light years away. So it takes light four years to get there. So the spacecraft had to move roughly at the fifth of the speed of light 
in order to get there in two decades. And uh, that's a thousand times faster than all the chemical rockets huh. we've used in the past. So a factor of a thousand is just like the difference between all the spacecrafts that we launched, starting with Sputnik, uh, compared to the a car that Henry Ford invented, you know, so that it's a huge increase in speed. And uh, I, I told him I need to think about it. And eventually with my group, um, we recommended uh, one technology that can accomplish that, and that's uh, light sails. And basically the idea is to have a very thin film, uh, very thin layer of material that is being pushed by a very powerful laser. Uh, if it weighs less than a gram and the laser has a hundred gigawatt uh, roughly in power, then within a few minutes it can be pushed by reflecting the light. Uh, it can be pushed uh, to a fifth of the speed of light. And so that's the concept. And we are currently working on the technology to do that. So you using- that so breakthrough Starshot, that's um that's the one that was founded in 2016. And if I'm not if I'm if I remember correctly, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's involved and Stephen Hawking at the time was as well. Right. Is, yes. that, is, is that the same one? Where this, the same? Yes. Starshot. It oh, is. Cool. Uh, That's uh, really cool. It is. We, we announced it in New York City and uh, Stephen Hawking came um, all the way from England uh, for the announcement, the public announcement. He also, uh, during the same uh, three weeks that he visited us, he also participated in, in the inauguration of a new center that we have at Harvard. Uh, called the Black Hole Initiative that I'm the founding director of. And and that center is focusing on the study of black holes. And I don't know if you remember, but um, about a couple of years ago, there was um, a a photograph of an image of a a black hole. Yeah, we we remember it. It was really cool. Yeah, we've we've talked about that. Yeah, it's amazing. And and, and the first and the place where it was... uh, derived this this image was in the conference room of the black hole initiative so uh we are very proud of that and so um yeah and stephen hawking came to my home during that visit um, it was an interesting time uh, both both uh, projects were announced at around the same time wow that is really cool so that the closest star being alpha centauri is that correct yes uh, well, it's a, a three-star system. It has Alpha Centauri A and B, which are very close to each other. They are roughly, uh, they are very similar to the Sun, each right. of them. Uh, but then you have Proxima Centauri, the third, right. uh, which is called also Alpha Centauri C. Uh, that's about 12% the mass of the Sun, so it's a dwarf star. But we know that there is a planet close to it, uh, which with roughly the same surface temperature as the Earth. It's about 20 times closer to this relatively faint uh, star. And um, and it's so close to the star that it, one side of it faces the star at all times. So it has a permanent day side mm. and night side. My daughters say that if we ever go there, they want a house on the strip that separates those two because <laughs> you see the sun. <laughs> You know, just think about it, uh, sitting in your porch and seeing the sunset forever. It ne- the sun never sets on that street. Yeah. Right. And you have your bedrooms on the backside, so you always got, it's yeah, always, always got nighttime. Night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's easy to go to bed. And you got your little breakfast nook at the front. Yeah, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> awesome. I now- expect a lot of the population would be right on that equator. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I should uh, warn you that um, this star emits mostly infrared light, not visible light. Oh, okay. So if there are any creatures on that planet, they must have infrared eyes. And I asked students in my class whether they know of any animal, any creature on Earth that has infrared eyes. One of them found an image of a shrimp. And the eyes look like um, uh, two ping pong balls connected with uh-huh. four head of the shrimp. That's probably, yeah. I think it's what is yeah. it? Like the, it's the mantis it shrimp, I think. One of them, mantis shrimp, you can see, at least what that's one type of shrimp I know it can see in multiple spectrums of light, or they, at least that's what they understand from the Hey, listen, the all I'm hearing is that when we move here, we can still have surf and turf, because I, <laughs> I like shrimp, so or this, gonna is, be giant this is sounding better people, and better. So. <laughs> oh well, it may explain why they don't come to visit us, because interstellar tourist agencies will never advertise our uh, vacation sites for them, because uh, the visible, they are always illuminated by visible light, and that hurts their eyes. And right. green grass, they are used to dark red grass. Grass. <laughs> now, Avi, uh, the main reason we wanted you to bring on the show 
is uh, you just released a book recently, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelli Intelligent Life Beyond Earth. And in right. that book, heavily you talk about the interstellar, the first interstellar visitor, Amuamua, which was back in 2017, which we talked about. We have a segment on our show called Space News, and we were like, this is, like, it was really cool at the time. And then it kind of faded away out of the mainstream, out of the news. And then you released this book. So for people who don't know or don't remember, what was this object, Amuamua, and why do you find it so interesting? Amuamua was the first uh, object that, came from outside the solar system that was spotted near Earth uh, with telescopes. And uh, it's sort of like finding an object from the street in your backyard. You can learn about the street without going needing to visit it. Uh, and at first people thought, the astronomers thought, oh, it must be just like the rocks we have seen before from the solar system, uh, except it didn't look like any of them. Uh, so, um, it uh, didn't have any cometary tail. There was no gas or dust surrounding it, and therefore it couldn't have been a comet. It, it, it was definitely not a comet of the type that we have seen many times before. Uh, and also, as it was tumbling every eight hours, uh, the amount of sunlight that it reflected changed by a factor of 10. So that meant that it had a very extreme shape, most likely pancake like, uh, so a flat shape, uh, again, very non-typical. Non uh, and uh, moreover, this object uh, exhibited an excess push away from the sun that, and, and there was a, a force acting on it that declined uh, inversely with distance squared from the sun. So uh, the only way I could have explained that uh, was to say that it's the reflection of sunlight that is pushing it. And for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin, sort of like a light sail. Light sail, yeah. Passing yeah. before. And, you know, nature doesn't make light sails. And so I suggested that it may be, uh, may have been manufactured by another civilization. And we actually, there was another object found in September 2020, uh, just uh, about uh, seven, eight months ago. And then... Uh, that object was given the name 2020 SO. It also exhibited an excess push from uh, the sun by reflecting sunlight without a cometary tail. It turns out that the astronomers that discovered it with the same telescope in Hawaii, and by the way, that's why the name Oumuamua right. was given, because right. it means, uh, Hawaiian language, it means a scout or a messenger from far away. Uh, at any event, this second object, 2020 SO, was identified as uh, a rocket booster from a lunar lander mission uh, in 1966. And we know that it had thin walls, it was very thin, and that's why it exhibited this push from the sun by reflecting sunlight. We know that it was artificial because we produced it. The question is who produced Oumuamua? Right, so uh, Oumuamua enters our solar system uh, you predict it to, you know, have a have an orbit or whatever around the sun, and then instead of like a normal comet, like would it might accelerate due to the gas like pushed off of it from the evaporation, right? And this seemed in your book, you say it had like a smooth acceleration, like it seemed like it was pushed along by some force. Yeah, there were a couple of things that made it different from the regular push uh, of a comet. Well, first of all, we didn't see a cometary tail. That's uh, point number one. But yeah. usually on comets, uh, the evaporation takes place in, in some hot spots uh, that produce jets. And uh, that introduces some jitter, some variation in the push uh, as the object is tumbling. Uh, and, and different spots are being exposed to the sunlight. So... Uh, we haven't seen any such uh, jitter. Uh, there is usually a change in the spin of the black of the of the object as it uh, as different jets operate, and we haven't seen that kind of a, a change in the spin. And um, and the other thing is that at a certain distance from the sun, water cannot evaporate anymore. So you you stop having this cometary activity at some distance. And Oumuamua reached that distance, but the force continued to decline smoothly without uh, an abrupt change, as you find in comets. So to me, that all of that was consistent with a push as a result of reflecting sunlight. And uh, um, 
uh, there were there was a lot of pushback from the scientific community to the idea that it's artificial. Uh, people ridiculed it and didn't want to discuss this possibility whatsoever. But all the suggestions that were made for a natural origin of this object invoked something that we've never seen before. Uh, for example, a cloud of dust particles that are very loosely bound, like a dust bunny that you find at home, a hundred yeah. times less dense than air. Uh, the problem with that is when it gets close to the sun and gets heated by hundreds of degrees, it will not maintain its integrity. So that doesn't really, it will not hold together. Uh, there was another suggestion that it's, it may be an iceberg made of hydrogen so that when it evaporates, you don't see the cometary tail because hydrogen is transparent. And we've never seen a hydrogen iceberg, right. but if it existed, it wouldn't survive the journey because uh, we showed in a scientific paper that it would evaporate very quickly. And then there was the suggestion that maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg, uh, the size of a football field, uh, chipped off the surface of another planet like Pluto that has uh, nitrogen on the surface. The problem with that is the mass budget. Uh, you basically need a uh, hundred times more mass than you have in stars altogether to make enough uh, nitrogen icebergs so that we will see one of them right. with a telescope in Hawaii. Um, and, and so that doesn't work out either. And then there was a suggestion, maybe it's a fragment, a, a piece of a bigger object that was uh, disrupted by passing close to a star. And the problem with that is usually you get elongated pieces, uh, not flat pieces. And moreover, the chance of passing close to a star is very small. So these were the proposals made by scientists that tried to find a natural origin. And all of them contemplated something that we've never seen before. And, and so I made the simple point that if it's something we've never seen before, you know, it may very well be a plastic bottle that we found on the beach. You know, most of the time we find rocks. Every now and then we find a plastic bottle that tells us there is a civilization out there. Right. And by so, the way, yeah. oh, yeah. one, one more important point. It's uh, very easy to tell the difference between the two, between a rock and a plastic bottle, if you have a close up photograph. So, if we get another object, as weird as Oumuamua was, uh, to be identified by a survey telescope in the coming years, uh, and we get the alert a year in advance, we can send a spacecraft equipped with a camera that will intercept its trajectory and take a close-up photograph, the way that the OSIRIS-REx, uh, which was a mission to the asteroid Bennu, uh, did. And, uh, if, you know, from... Uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, in my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words. The right. number of <laughs> my book. I would write a book if you had a photograph. No kidding. Dan, you had a question? Uh, yeah. Um, just like a, a point of clarification that I wanted to ask you about was um, you mentioned that this was Oumuamua was the first interstellar object to come close to our sun. Now, how often do our, is that it's not the first interstellar object to come through our solar system or is that? Does that point still stand? No, no, it's not. Um, right now in the solar system, there should be a quadrillion of them, you know, 10 to the power 15 of such objects, because it takes a, a more than 10,000 years to cross the entire solar system, the Oort cloud, right. the speed that Oumuamua was moving. So right now there are plenty of those objects. It's just the first one that we noticed because... Uh, you know, pan stars did not exist. Uh, this survey telescope did not exist many years ago. Uh, this telescope was designed to find near Earth objects. And, you know, Congress about uh, 15 years ago issued uh, a, a task to NASA to find the um, 90% of all the objects bigger than the size of a football field, 140 meters or so. Uh, that's roughly 1% of the size of the rock that killed the dinosaurs. You know, that rock was the size of Manhattan Island, uh, much bigger by at least a hundred times. Uh, so uh, we want to know of all the rocks that have a chance of hitting Earth so that we can avoid, can, we, we could deflect them and, and avoid a catastrophe. You know, we are smarter than the dinosaurs were. They're not around anymore, but we want to survive right. such a hit. 
Uh, and uh, so that's why Panstas was designed. And uh, in less than uh, three years, there would be a much better telescope serving the sky called the, the Vera Rubin Observatory. And it should find about 60% of all these objects. And uh, so that, that was the goal. And then in the process of surveying the sky, completely by surprise, uh, it, it found this object that moved much too fast to be bound to the sun. It was clearly from outside the solar system, it was moving too fast to be trapped by the sun. And um, and so that was a surprise because a decade earlier, I actually wrote the, the first paper that forecasted how many rocks should we see from other stars. And uh, if you just make the analogy with the solar system, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have expected pan stars to find any. So the actual detection of this object by itself was a surprise. Right. Astounding. It's yeah. I, it's I, amazing. I definitely wanted to have you, uh, someone who knows what he's talking about, to make the point that it is it's absolutely incredible that we found it. Like it's <laughs> something yeah, monumental. When we, when, the, when we first heard the news, we were like, this is amazing. And then it died so fast. Like, does no one else think this? And then the opportunity to interview you came up and like, oh, yeah, this is going to be great. Um, I wanted to go back to because the shape of it. So you, in your book, you say it's like maybe 10 to 15 times longer than what it was wide. What, was there a, what's the best guess of estimate of size? Yeah, so uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope tried to detect any heat emitted from this object. We know how hot it got because uh, we know the trajectory, how close it came to the sun. And the temperature that you get to depends just on the distance from the sun. So from the fact that the Spitzer Space Telescope didn't detect any heat or infrared light coming from this object, uh, one can put a, a limit on how big it was. We know the temperature, but if it was very small, then you wouldn't detect any heat because you get very little light coming from it. And so the limit was about uh, 200 meters. That's the upper limit. It couldn't have been bigger than that. Right. They couldn't have been smaller than 20 meters, which is 10 times smaller than that. It couldn't be smaller than that because we saw a certain amount of sunlight reflected. So even if it was a perfect mirror, it should have been at least 20 meters. So somewhere between 20 meters and 200 meters, you know, the size of a football field or 10 times smaller, that's uh, the characteristic range that, that we can assign to this object. We don't know what is its reflectance, uh, you know, which fraction of the sunlight it reflected. So if you wanted to pick a guess, I would say about 100 meters in size. Um, but then um, because it's the amount of light varied by changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling every eight hours, that meant that projected on the sky, it was at least 10 times longer than it is wide. But the shape of it was most likely pancake shape based on the analysis of the amount of light that it reflected. And it, the way, best way to think of it is just like a piece of paper tumbling in the wind. You know, intrinsically it's flat. But as it's tumbling in the wind, when you look at it, it looks elongated uh, in projection. You know, so uh, you, uh, there was this cartoon that was displayed in many places of a cigar shaped object. Mm. But that's just in projection. If you look at a piece of paper in projection, it looks like a cigar. But intrinsically, it's like a pancake. Right. Or I've heard it mentioned before, possibly saucer shaped. Uh, well, <laughs> a flat object. Flat uh, object. Yeah, you can make whatever you want uh, out of it, um, but certainly not uh, something we have seen before. And, you know, this is the first time that we use scientific instruments, uh, telescopes, and see something that looks unusual. And so I thought, you know, uh, just uh, behaving like a kid, you know, like someone that wants to understand the world, you know, and I don't care how many likes I get on Twitter or how popular I am. I just put it on the table that we should, you know, this is very intriguing and we should get more data. We should take a photograph of the next weird object. And But to my surprise, uh, there was a huge amount of pushback from other scientists. They didn't want to discuss this possibility. You know, there was a talk, uh, a lecture at the Harvard about this object. And when I left the room with a colleague of mine, he said, you know, this object is so weird, I wish it never existed. So <laughs> it actually bothered people that there are these anomalies. 
they would have been happier if the anomalies did not exist. To me, that's surprising because I'm actually thrilled whenever there is something new, you know, it's an opportunity to learn something new about nature. So we should be really glad if we see something that doesn't quite behave the way we expected. Yeah, 100%. Like, I don't know why. Like, yeah, I think that was, that was the main point that I, or the main takeaway I took from a lot of uh, discussion about this was that you you simply, in your paper that, that you published uh, in the academic journal, um, you mainly just entertain the theory. You just want people to entertain the theory that this object could perhaps be uh, either a sign or an artifact of another intelligent civilization out there and you you simply just you state it as that it's like working off the data that we do have which i i guess like relatively isn't that much like it's like yeah when yeah, you look and, at it <clears throat> yeah and and the way i thought of this is just like a wake-up call you know we've been for example we've been uh, looking for radio signals uh, from the sky from other civilizations we haven't uh, heard anything and uh, but that's just like trying to have a phone conversation. You need the counterpart to be alive. And it's possible that, you know, there is no other civilization exactly at this time that is exactly at our technological maturity. So either there are most cultures that exist that had this technology of radio communication, either they're dead or Maybe they developed other technologies well more, you know, much more advanced than radio communication and they just do not communicate by radio waves. So, but the point is, you know, it's not the best approach to look for them because there may be a very narrow window of opportunity for another civilization to be exactly the same technological development as we are. A, a much better approach is to search for relics that they left behind. Mm, you know, yeah. on Earth, we, we are talking about archaeology, you know, making uh, archaeological digs and looking for relics that were left behind by cultures that existed in the past and are not around anymore. They died. And, and we can do the same thing in space. You know, most of the stars uh, formed billions of years before the sun. So if they had... Uh, civilizations like ours that they sent equipment into space, like we sent uh, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, New Horizons. There should be a lot of equipment out there in space uh, accumulating over the billions of years. Most of it will be trash, you know, will not be functional because a lot of time elapsed since this equipment was sent. But we can find, find it. Uh, just like Omo, we, we will see something unusual in the sky and uh, we could take a photograph of it. And if it looks really uh, artificial, then we can land on it. And maybe we can read off the label that says made on planet X. And maybe we can import the technology to Earth. You know, that can be worth a lot of money. So you're, you're talking about investing more in space archaeology rather than like, because you, you say like, I've heard you in interviews before say, uh, people spend so much time on multiverse theory, string theory, all these interdimensional theories when, I, and that's all, I mean, that's interesting stuff, but at the same time, chances of, you know, proof are much slimmer than finding an object tumbling around space. That's right. And uh, I simply <clears throat> cannot understand the resistance to discussing technological relics, searching for them and investing the funds to find them. You see, um, uh, for example, the National Science Foundation invested the $1.1 billion in looking for uh, gravitational waves. And, you know, the uh, uh, astronomy community invested hundreds of millions of dollars searching for the dark matter, what makes most of the matter in the universe. We don't know what it is. And we haven't found it. Uh, but in all cases, we invest huge sums of money to find evidence for something new. And um, we should expect the same, you know, here, if we don't put the effort, if we don't put a billion dollars forward in the search for technological relics, we might not find it. It, it may be a self-fulfilling prophecy to say, oh, it's always rocks, Let, let's not even imagine that possibility. Uh, and then <clears throat> when people argue you need extraordinary evidence, my point is, they don't allow for that evidence if they ridicule it to start with and if they don't fund it at right. the level of a billion dollars. So um, it's just like stepping on the grass and saying, look, the grass doesn't grow. Uh, this is not the right approach. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. Yeah.
on empty. Every day, innocent theorists are verbally abused, shot down, or roasted, and are crying out for your help. Please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash alien theorist podcast with over 100 hours of bonus content. For just 16 cents a day, you can help a theorist raise their glass with wine, whiskey, other various inebriants, and love. Join in the next 30 minutes, and you'll be enjoying extra segments and podcasts such as co-conspirators, ATT confidentials, nerds, and many more future segments. Right now, there's a theorist who needs you. Your donation says, you guys are dummies, but you're pretty funny. Please donate. Right now. Right. Yeah. So I had yeah. a I had a hypothetical and in, in, in on the point of uh, I guess you would call it uh, space archaeology or xeno archaeology. I mean, we have xenobiology, which is a, a subfield of synthetic biology uh, already. Like there are there are people there are scientists who are xenobiologists, and I think some of them were involved in the just recently when they found that was it the sulfide gas or the gas coming off of Venus. Um, Possibly, you know, you had to consult xenobiologists, like could a, a life form exist with, with xenoarchaeology, if you were to be consulted, you personally would uh, be consulted on designing a curriculum for a xenoarchaeologist. Like, what would that what would that look like? Like, I, I'm curious to think, like, what would it look like? Well, I, uh, you know, I have a, a weekly commentary in Scientific American once a week or two weeks. Uh, and, and one of them was um, on this subject. And right now, the way I see it is we will find more interstellar objects. And some of them would look as weird as Oumuamua was. And uh, what we need is to take photographs, uh, close-up photographs, which we can do. If we get an alert a year in advance, we can send a spacecraft that will intercept the, the trajectory of those and maybe even land on them just like Osiris Rex landed on uh, asteroid Bennu. And then uh, uh, that's the first step to take. Basically examine all the objects that uh, come to our vicinity that we can identify, say, with the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, that look as weird as Oumuamua was, and uh, plan to, to take a photograph of them and, and find those plastic bottles among all the rocks mm. that there. Now, some of them would be really rocks. I mean, we the second interstellar object, object that was found was uh, found by a, a Russian amateur astronomer named Gennady Borisov, and it looked just like a comet. And so people came to me and said, well, this one looks like a comet. It's the second one discovered, and it's obviously natural. So doesn't it convince you that Oumuamua was also natural? And to that I said, you know, if I find a plastic bottle on the beach and then I see uh, rocks afterwards, it doesn't make the plastic bottle a rock. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then so I would kind of ask what, um, so if, if so if we were to say, find this plastic bottle, uh, scientists find a plastic bottle, space bottle, um, how would they go about approaching it like, what do you think would be the overarching theory or the working theory that they should go against it? Should they be like, should they compare it to bottles on Earth? Should you, should, could you compare it to like analogs of what we have it, where as 
perhaps this culture, this space culture could be wildly different or have developed completely different from us? Like, wh how do you think they should approach it? Oh, it, it's very simple. Uh, you know, in science, this should be part of a scientific research program. You know, in science, you want to get as much evidence as possible, as much information as possible, because that helps you figure out what, what it's all about. And so uh, in, in, in this context, what you want is to land on such an object, just like Osiris Rex landed on asteroid Bennu, and then uh, explore it. Just, you know, <laughs> put your hands around it uh, mm -hmm. and see what, what it's all about and, and get as much information of, uh, as possible and uh, broadcast it to Earth and maybe even take a sample of what's on it and bring it to Earth. You know, uh, Osiris Rex uh, took uh, a sample of uh, the material on Bennu and is supposed to bring it back to Earth. And you can imagine something similar. And then, of course, once we figure out what the technology is all about, you know, it can advance us because if that if it took a million years to develop that technology, you know, it, it may represent uh, what we will develop a million years from now. So it's sort of like giving us a jump start, a, a, a quantum leap in our own development to figure out what it's all about. So I think we should be humble, modest, not try to... Uh, forecast what it's all about, but, you know, just learn what it's all about. It's a learning experience. Uh, just think about a caveman that uh, is presented with a cell phone. The caveman is used to playing with rocks. So the first thing the caveman would say, oh, the, the cell phone must be a shiny rock. But then uh, once uh, the caveman starts... One of those flip rocks. <laughs> <laughs> once he starts playing with it, you know, it will start uh, showing all kinds of features that rocks do not show. So, you know, as long as the caveman is a, a sufficiently intelligent, then, you know, it, it will try to figure out what it's all about. And uh, we can learn from studying these objects. Right. Now, I wanted to ask, I, I know the answer, but I want a, a little hypothetical. You say it's very hard to pinpoint the origin of a muamua because orc clouds extend so far out that they start almost touch other orc clouds of different systems. But is there, do you have any like guess of where this thing may have came? Just a guess, hypothetical. Well, the, the big problem about Oumuamua, that was another very weird property that it had, was that it was parked in the galactic parking lot. And what I mean by that is, um, the stars are moving relative to each other at some random speed. And uh, you can average over these motions of stars in the vicinity of the sun, and you get to a frame of reference that is called the local standard of rest, which is basically the frame of the galaxy locally when you average over the random motions of the stars nearby. And uh, it looks like Oumuamua came from that frame. It was at rest in the local standard of rest. And only one in 500 stars is so much at rest in that frame. So that was very weird because if it came from a star, it should have inherited the motion of the star relative to that frame. Right. So why would it be in that in the local standard of rest? I mean, I can think of a couple of possibilities, either that it's a, a member of a grid of objects uh, that uh, are used for navigation, you know, just like road posts, that if you navigate in interstellar space, there are all these objects that tell you where you are. Uh, another possibility is that it was um, a, a part of a relay uh, system for communication. Uh, but at any event, the motion of this object relative to the sun was just the motion of the sun relative to the local standard of rest. It was just like a buoy sitting at rest on the surface of the ocean and the sun, like a giant boat, a giant ship, bumped into it and kicked it. Uh, and, and, and it's really mysterious as to why it was in that frame. You can't associate it with any star in particular. That's really cool. The unknown origins of a Muamua. <laughs> yes. Um, since your book has come out, what have, have like the thoughts of your peers changed at all? I know they were very, you know, they're very dismissive at the start, but after reading your book and looking more into your work, has the like the academic thought of this being an extraterrestrial object changed at all? Well, um, those that read the book uh, send me messages uh, that are 
very uh, positive and congratulatory, but most uh, of the critics probably didn't read the book uh, and they right. will not read the book. So the real problem is uh, people operate by prejudice. You know, it takes them out of their comfort zone and therefore they refuse to go out of their comfort zone and they dismiss it up front and they can ridicule the entire idea without looking at the evidence, without explaining the anomalies. Uh, and those that tried to explain the anomalies as a, a natural object, they had to come up with something we've never seen before. So that already tells you that what I'm saying, you know, is, is must be true, because otherwise someone would come with something that we've seen before that explains all the all the facts, you know. Um, and so um, I got a lot of uh, feedback from the public, you know, from uh, people like there was a woman in Malawi that sent me an email saying uh, that uh, she found the book to be great and it convinced her to become perhaps an astronomer. And I, I was uh, thrilled to get that. And uh, another, an undergraduate in, in uh, Columbia, Latin America, that said that uh, reading about my work changed her life. And I get a lot of these messages that basically tell me that whoever reads the book um, gets very excited. And my hope is that this subject will enter into the mainstream. But at the same time, you see a lot of dismissal, you know, in, um, on Twitter and other social media. I don't have an account and therefore, you know, I, I don't read all of those. Um, but, um, but it is uh, sometimes uh, unfortunate that people attack me personally rather than dealing with the evidence because it's not about me. It's about this object being weird. And if you don't have an explanation for that, you should accept the possibility that it might be artificial. It has nothing to do with me. I'm just talking about the evidence, just like I do in the context of any other scientific subject. Right. Because just like other fields of science, like wasn't it was like 40 or 50 years of like before plate tectonics were accepted, right? Like that's so right. When there's a new a new idea and there's like an ingrained you know, ingrained thought in the community, it takes so long for people to slow. It almost takes like a new generation to come up reading your book and getting involved, right? Yeah, so that's in the in the optimistic case, uh, that's what's needed, a few decades. But if you look at the history of humans, uh, you know, starting with Socrates, uh, he basically questioned some popular views at his time and suggested this method of dialogue and uh, he was accused of corrupting the youth. He was put in jail and executed yeah. by being forced to drink poison. Okay, that's Socrates, <laughs> one of the great philosophers we ever had. Uh, and um, nowadays, he would have been, that was by the citizens of Athens at the time, and it was a city state. And nowadays, he would have been cancelled on uh, social media um, yeah. <laughs> by the Athenians, you know, the, the, that culture, because they basically argue that he uh, dismissed the gods that they believed in. And as a result, he needs to die. Um, that was in ancient Greece, you know. And uh, then uh, uh, you look at, uh, for example, Galileo Galilei, you know, when he tried to argue that it doesn't look like we are at the center of the world, that the earth moves around the sun. The philosophers at the time just put him in house arrest so that he will not have a lot of influence. And... Uh, what did they accomplish? They remained ignorant. They didn't look through his telescope. And the Earth continued to move around the sun. The Earth doesn't care what these philosophers are saying. You know, uh, reality is whatever it is. Even if we close the windows and not look out, you know, our neighbors are still out there. You know, if, if just right. think about being on a street, you know, who cares whether you look out the window or not? Your neighbors exist. They have nothing to do with whether you accept them or not. And so... Uh, you know, the same is true about Giordano Bruno. He was um, an Italian uh, uh, scientist philosopher that argued that, you know, other stars may be just like the sun and they may have planets like the earth. And as a result, they may have life near them. And he was burnt on the stake. And there are many such examples, even in recent history of ideas being dismissed. Uh, and so there is nothing new here except that I'm disappointed that we haven't learned a lesson from history because, you know, what I'm talking about is a matter of common sense. You know, we know that half of the stars, like the sun, have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. And so if you arrange for similar circumstances to those on Earth, why wouldn't you assume as a matter of common sense that you get similar outcomes, that 
cultures like us, you know, uh, uh, technological civilizations are common, that we are just like ants on a sidewalk, you know, there are many more, and that there is nothing special about us. That would be the starting point, uh, rather than believing that we are unique and special and we need extraordinary evidence to, to actually find if there are others out there. And by the way, we shut off the window, we don't even want to look. Right. We Find it, and we ridicule anyone that discusses the possibility that they might exist. So, I mean, that to me sounds like a, a point of view from from ancient history, from the Middle Ages or something. But how come in the 21st century, that is a, the prevailing view of the scientific community, of people in academia? And I think the public in general is much more open-minded about this, this question. For sure. I mean... I, Go for it, in the scientific community, have you have you kind of noticed any uh, with because w- the government's come out and released the the vi- the footage of the Nimitz and the Tic Tac of those unidentified flying objects? They're not sure what they are. Has has any of that impacted the scientific community of maybe them being more open to these things being artificial? With the government coming out with these you know military videos and you have these accounts of these eyewitness accounts have have you seen any kind of like opening in the scientific community of that or are they still taking a hard stance of like this is no <laughs> no i mean uh, on the contrary um uh, the stance gets even firmer um you know and uh, all this evidence is being dismissed uh, offhand uh, now the way i think we can make progress is if uh, we deploy scientific instruments you know the nowadays we have state of the art cameras and uh, audio sensors that could be deployed in the same locations where the reports came from. And you know, we can just do a, a scientific experiment and see if there is anything unusual. And and that will be open data. It will not be classified. And I think that's the way, to, once again, to convince everyone if there is something unusual. So rather than argue, you know, I think we should just collect better evidence that is reproducible, you know. Right. Uh, and, and the same holds for objects like Oumuamua or for uh, these reports. Awesome. Now, on that on that note, just a just a quick one. Do you think any, any type of ET being has ever been to Earth in the past or present? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I I'll tell you what I, my my uh, gut feeling is. I think that we are not sufficiently interesting for them to come and visit us. <laughs> presumptuous for us to assume that they are around or that they came. You know, it reminds me of uh, the friends that my wife had when uh, I first dated her. And those (laughs) friends uh, used to think that there will be a Prince Charming coming to see them on a white horse and making them a marriage proposal. It never happened. And they had to compromise with (laughs) whoever around. So I think it's a natural tendency of humans to think, you know, we are sufficiently interesting they will come over and have a party in our backyard. Uh, and, you know, it's not at all clear to me that we are that interesting. I think things like us probably exist elsewhere in many places. So I wouldn't be surprised if they never came here. Right on. I know you got, you're got you a busy man and we appreciate your time. So we're going to let you go here. But before you go, uh, where can people find your book and more about your work? Uh, if you put my name in Google, Avi loeb l-o-e-b you you can get to my website um, at harvard university that uh, features all the publications uh, that i put out and as well as videos of interviews and other things Um, and uh, of course the book is available in any uh, outlet outlet that uh, sells books and i very much hope that people will enjoy it i'm currently starting to work on my next book can you give us a sneak peek on what that will be about it's still work in progress, work in uh, progress. Uh, but it, 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 it will not be unrelated. Awesome. Can't wait for it. All right. Uh, if you're looking to hear more about Avi Loeb, you can check him out. He'll be speaking, presenting at Contact in the Desert, June 25th to 28th. Um, uh, stay tuned to contactinthedesert.com for the full schedule. I don't think it's been released yet. But Avi Loeb, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. All right. Take yeah. care. Have a good one. Bye. Take it easy. Thank you. I enjoyed it. That was awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Good seeing you. Um, Ryan, I saw you from above, but uh, I guess... Yeah. I can- <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about that. We, uh, I had it set up before. I even did a trial, but I guess when you get two Skype feeds, they like cancel each other out. 
through the network. So, uh, I mean, you look good from above as well. I got a night. Yeah, yeah. My, my hat looks great. <laughs> You're not you're not missing anything uh, not seeing Dan and I so <laughs> <laughs> Zell's the looker so that's all you you're not missing anything. Braden has had his nose fixed so he has two black yeah. eyes so <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good speaking with you. Thanks Abby. We'll yeah. Thank good you luck. very much. Take care. Bye. Woo! Abby, low fucking beauty. Keep up to date with all things alien theorist theorizing. Follow us across social media on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, and Facebook. For updates on new videos and content on YouTube, don't forget to click like and subscribe and hit that notifications button to keep those eyes on the skies with alien theorists theorizing.